Good evening. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer before we do anything else. Father, thank you for a chance to gather together and to uh, study your word, to <clears throat> greet one another and share one another's burdens and just to be together, Lord. We thank you for that gift. Pray that you would uh, be with us this evening as we uh, have this time, that it would be beneficial to us, that you would speak to us through uh, the uh, different things that happen. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a song tonight, and it's one you know. It's, it is well with my soul. Theoretically, it's going to be on that screen right there. Oh, it'd be even better if you could see it, though. Okay, hang on. Hold on.
That's a, a great way to start our uh, time tonight, at least for me. I, I uh, enjoy the truth of that song. Things can be great. Things can be rotten. You can still be okay uh, with your soul. But the deeper truths is, are still that God loves us and that God has taken care of us and made a way for us to uh, know him and to be with him. So we want to praise him for that tonight. Uh, let's go to prayer. Uh, I want to remember Clarence, still not quite out of the woods yet, not out of that place. Uh, Tom's dad, uh, Carmen. <coughs> and Jody. And Jody. Um, anyone else? Your family that's coming, right? And is that Caleb? Okay. Someone else? Mary. Mary and Jean. Well, let's, let's uh, look to the Lord. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the sunshine and the warmer weather. Always an encouragement to us, Lord. We don't want to be shallow, but we do enjoy the nicer time outside. Pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we study. Pray, Lord, for these that we've mentioned, for... Uh, Caleb and his family as they travel, pray that you give them a safe trip, help them, Lord, while they're here to uh, have a, a nice visit with, with uh, Kathy and Glenn. But more than that, Lord, help them to draw close to you and that this would be a time of uh, real um, impact in their life. Lord, we pray for uh, Carmen and Jody, that you'd be with them and the struggles that they're facing right now, be with Tom and uh, his dad and the family that are dealing with these issues that none of us really want to, but we most of us have to at some point. Pray for Clarence that you would watch over him and help them to be able to get everything kind of taken care of him and squared away so he can come back home. Pray for Mary and Jean that you would be with them and their separate issues that they've got going on, Lord. They, they'd really like to be in church, but they're having such trouble. We just pray that you would watch over them. Be with our uh, service this Sunday, Lord. Uh, be with our church in general. There's just some some things going on, Lord, that, that uh, you know about and that you can help us through and help us with. And we just pray that you uh, make our church a place where people know they're going to hear your word and that they're going to be uh, loved and appreciated. We ask these things in Jesus' name. All right, <clears throat> we are uh, looking at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 tonight, and uh, if you want to follow along in one of the few Bibles, it's 1887, uh, otherwise it's in the back of your Bible, right after James and a little bit before Revelation. Um, 
So as we look at this uh, study tonight, let's uh, read the passage and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, let's see. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts of in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. All right, when, uh, <clears throat> when you encounter children in public and you see how they're acting, do you ever wonder why they're acting the way they do? Yeah. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> Here's a good question. How many here have had opinions about that before before you yourselves had kids that perhaps changed a little bit after you had kids. Anybody like that? <laughs> You'd see people's other people's kids before you had kids and then you had an opinion and maybe your mother said something to you like mine did. Listen, you, maybe when you have kids, then you can have an opinion. Um, I think that's probably just about universal. Um, I was looking online and I found a list of why kids misbehave. And here are nine reasons. Number one, they want attention. Number two, they're imitating. Number three, to test limits. Number four, they lack skills. Number five, to show their independence. Number six, now this is not my list, I just found this. Number six, they have big emotions. Number seven, they have unmet needs. Number eight, to exert power and control. And number nine, they've learned misbehavior. Now, when I looked at that list, when I look at number uh, one, two, three, seven, eight, and nine, so I'll, that's most of them. So uh, not they lack skills, not to show their independence, and not they have big emotions, but everything else. I noticed that uh, we could make the case that those things, those other reasons, had a lot to do with the parent. Now, don't even try to pretend that you are like so magnanimous that you've never seen kids misbehaving in public and thought bad of their parents. Don't lie right here in church in front of everybody. Because I know you have. Oh, oh no. No. <laughs> Tell the truth. It, it, we have. Okay? Uh, so, like, for example, they want attention. They're imitating to test limits. Uh, they have unmet needs to exert power and control. They've learned misbehavior. I think you can make a case that, and maybe even uh, number four, they lack skills. I think you can make a case that a lot of what happens with the kid has a way of pointing at the parent. Yeah. It just does. <laughs> okay? Or the adult in charge. It's always fascinating to me in my years in the classroom how, um, yeah, I was forced because I was a uh, good husband and a good father. I was forced to teach classroom music because otherwise I might have just like walked out the door. If I was only feeding myself, I might have done that, but I didn't. Um, but anyway, when I taught classroom music, that means that you're teaching like, you know, all the fifth graders. Well, they, don't, they come down as a class. So there were about seven different fifth grade teachers. So I would see classroom after classroom of those kids. It's always fascinating to me how certain teachers, just year after year, certain teachers, they always got the good class. And other teachers, year after year, man, they always got stuck with the bad kids. Yeah. And it all that my principal would say, it all comes down to leadership. Uh, but anyway, let's look at our scripture verse. Uh, the first one, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now we spent the, 
the last three weeks on the Thanksgiving section of this letter. We saw Peter was really sort of establishing the basis for the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, having laid the groundwork for that, he pivots. And he pivots with the word, therefore. There, there's so much in this letter that it would be just tremendously beneficial to you to read and reread it throughout the course of our study. Uh, and I really do mean that. It's not a very long one. Uh, even if you just like read chapter one every week until we weren't on chapter one again, and then you went to chapter two. Uh, there's just so much. It's, I think I might've said this a couple, three weeks ago. It's dense. There's just so much in there. Uh, so we've talked about salvation our hope in the resurrection, this wonderful thing that Jesus did for us. And it's almost as though we've like sat down on Christmas or on our birthday to find this wonderfully wrapped gift. And we can tell by looking at it, they put so much time and effort and an expense into the wrapping. What's in it must be fantastic. If you've never gotten a gift like that, well, I'm sorry. Imagine. <laughs> uh, we, you unwrap it really slowly and carefully and just rip it into it because even everything on the outside just looks fantastic as well. It's just obviously something really nice and even the, the wrapping paper is worthy of attention. But you make it to the gift itself and then it's just awesome. So that's the therefore. All of the... The therefore is in between the gift and the opening of the gift. Now Peter makes this transition from thanksgiving to exhortation. Now, being around church is where you're more than likely to hear the word exhortation in just you know, your regular life. Not a word that we use much other places, most people anyway. Uh, I wonder if we really know what exhortation is. It's, it's made up of, of uh, two parts. The X, E-X, is part, one, part of it. And then there's this H-O-R-T, which comes from a Latin word, hortari. Okay. So the X, it, or the, uh, sorry, the hortari part means to encourage or to urge someone, to encourage or to urge. The X is like out of or from. So what Peter's doing here is he's urging us from what's already been established. In other words, we, we have this hope of salvation that we've been looking at in verses, uh, I think, 3 through 12. This hope of salvation we should let that change how we live our daily lives. In grammatical terms, don't want to get too in the weeds, but I want you to understand this. In grammatical terms, Peter switches from the indicative mood to, in the Thanksgiving section, to the imperative mood now. So in other words, that other part, he tells us what, he indicates, that's the indicative mood, he tells us what, and now, the imperative, he's telling us, well, now what? So we have the what, <coughs> now what? And the imperative is like, you must. It's imperative that you do something, we know that's like, it's really important, okay? Uh, Daniel Powers wrote the commentary I've been reading, he puts it this way, First, the grace and hope believers receive from God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ obligates them to live accordingly. And second, the reality of God's grace and hope empowers believers to fulfill the imperative of Christ-likeness. First, the grace and hope believers receive from God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ obligates them to live accordingly. And second, the reality of God's grace and hope 
empowers believers to fulfill the imperative of Christ-likeness. Okay? So, <coughs> let's think about this verse again. Um, when you wear a robe as your everyday attire, most of us do not do that, but like think of any flannel graph you ever saw when you were a kid of <laughs> Bible people, and they're wearing this robe thing. They had to deal with um, how to manipulate that thing for different situations and different occasions, okay? Uh, and they had to come up, you know, deal with the pros and the cons of that garment. If you're going to do quick work like running or like heavy work where your feet need to be really steady, well then you're going to gird up your loins, which means you're going to gather this thing up and pull it up in front and tuck it into your belt. The belt could be called a girdle because it goes around, which is what that word means. If you girdle a tree, you take a little cut all the way around the bark of the tree and it kills it, you know, because the stuff can't flow up and down. Okay, so a girdle goes around. That's what, you know, like when I was a kid, I always loved it when we sang, we'll girdle the globe with salvation because it always made me laugh. <laughs> Because I had a mother and I knew what a girdle was. <laughs> to me, that was always one of those TE moments. But girdle just means going around. Okay, so if you're the, the verb form of that is to gird, to put around. So they take that thing, that robe, and tuck it in here. Now it's not flopping around down there in your way. Now you're let it, now it's almost like pants. Okay, so um, men would Let's see. So when, when Peter says here to gird up the loins of your mind, he's sort of saying, now get ready for some thinking. Get ready to wrap your mind about around what I'm getting ready to tell you. You're ready to ponder what's be, getting ready to be said. So they would have known absolutely and instantly what gird up your loins meant because they knew what that meant because that's how they dressed. So when he says that about your mind, it's like, oh, okay. So now it's going to be some like thinking thing. Okay. He also says, <clears throat> uh, uses the word sober. And we could, uh, that word can be translated and often is as self control or like being level headed. He then says to rest fully on the grace that we've been talking about. So again, the verse is, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And again, the therefore, because of all that stuff about salvation, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, those are action terms. They're action terms. Not something that's just happening to them. These are things that Peter and the Holy Spirit are telling them and us to do. They're, these are things that Peter is saying, you must do this. That's the exhortation part. I want you to do these things. Why did Peter have someone? No, it's the Holy Spirit inspired him to write this. Peter's the leader of the church. So we have to take seriously what he's saying. Peter was... Jesus' closest disciple. He saw in action how Jesus lived. He heard everything Jesus taught. And you might say, yeah, but he didn't, right, he didn't always before Pentecost, but this is after Pentecost. And now it all makes sense because the Holy Spirit has come on him and taught him everything that Jesus had been saying. Now the Holy Spirit's taught him what it all means. So we have to take his words seriously. So he's saying here, this, this is not something that just happens to you. You have to do these things. You have to gird up the loins of your mind. You have to get ready to think. Christianity is not a bunch of emotion. It's a thinking thing. Okay? Not everybody that's a Christian is a deep thinker, and that's okay because the Holy Spirit helps. The Holy Spirit enables but it is a logical 
makes sense kind of thing. Uh, he says, you have to be sober. You have to be self-controlled. You have to be that. Now, I've never had personal experience in uh, becoming sober in the way the world would discuss that. That just has, it's not, doesn't make me better. I mean, it's better that I didn't do it, but it, I mean, it just, that's just the way it is, okay? I'm not trying to virtue signal or something. I just don't know about it. It seems to me, from what I've seen in other people and what I've seen on television, that becoming sober is something that you do to yourself. You're either waiting it out or you're like taking some other thing to try to counteract the alcohol or the drug. But it's not something somebody else comes on you and they make you sober, right? So when he says be sober, it's on you. Okay? That, I mean, the word sober, in the way the world uses that, it's the same thing. Self-controlled. I mean, as an aside, that's why people ought not to, to uh, drink themselves silly or take drugs that might alter their minds. Because you, be, you can't be level-headed and you can't be self-controlled with that stuff. That's why it's a bad deal. So, be sober. Then he says, uh, rest your hope fully upon the grace that's to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So these, these things are doing things. Now it's important for us to understand, we want to be clear, Christianity, unlike all other religions, Christianity is not a religion of doing. It's a, uh, it is a, a, um, a relationship with God. However, what we mean by that is we can't do things to earn our salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn a spot in heaven. That's not what Christianity is. That's every other religion, and it's a false hope. That's why some People in other religions strap bombs to themselves because they think they're earning their way into heaven. That's why some people get on their knees multiple times a day, pointing at the right direction, saying the right words. That's why some people carry a little thing and count the little beads as they say enough prayers to make sure they've done enough to please God for that day. None of that is the Bible. That's not, the, that's not Christianity. Christianity is not a religion of doing. However, what Peter is getting at here is, <clears throat> is that the salvation we have received from God, so like we didn't earn it, it's been given to us and we have accepted it. That salvation, that gift from God, <clears throat> absolutely should issue forth in actions. It should. If you give someone a gift and they don't act like they even cared about it, are you not a little bit bothered by that? You're not a little bit miffed? Especially if it was some really nice thing and they just didn't, they just mistreated or they, care, they act like it doesn't even matter to them? You wouldn't like that. The expected and the accepted thing is that when someone, you know, you get this gift, well, it's, it changes something about you, at least to the point where you express gratitude on a human basis. But what Peter's saying, this salvation, it's everything. And because it's everything, it ought to change the way you live your life. Absolutely, period. It should change the way you live your life. It should issue forth in action. Verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Uh, think back, John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus 
snuck in to see Jesus under cover of darkness so the important people wouldn't see him. And he was talking to Jesus. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus that he needed? Be born again. He needed to be born again. Right. When you're born, you are a child of your mother. If you're there when it happens, and you see that baby come out, you know that baby is a child of that mother. Okay? If you're born again, born of the Spirit, then by definition, you are a child of God. Okay? If you are a child of God, then God is your father. Is God a good parent? He is. Okay. Can we say that God is a good father? Yeah, if you like praise and worship music, you might even say he's a good, good father. Because there's a song like that. Okay? All right. So remember I said this is Peter, like, gird up your loins? This is what I'm talking about. you got to think this through. Okay? You're, you're smart people. You can do this. So God is a good father. Then we... As children of a good father should be acting as obedient children because you never once saw no matter what else is true I, I, I stand by this I'm not gonna take a poll because you're not gonna convince me otherwise you never once saw some screaming kid throwing an absolute fit over nonsense in the grocery store or Walmart and thought to yourself, man, that dad's doing a bang up job. You never thought that. You always thought the opposite. You thought, if you were really magnanimous, you might have thought, maybe he doesn't have a dad. And then you, maybe you're magnanimous enough to think, well, if I'm a single mom, Okay, but you didn't think a good thing about it. You didn't think it was an evidence of good parenting. No matter what else is true, that I, be, I believe that. Okay, so when we discussed children a few minutes ago, we sort of agreed that children, when children misbehave, we just often look at the parent and we start making some sort of value judgments. You just do. You can talk about whether that's good or bad or, oh, we shouldn't judge. Yeah, whatever. You cannot convince me that there isn't a moment in your mind when you've done that. Because we're all adults. If you'd come to school with me and see multiple of those little deers all at once, you might even do that more often. Okay? But kids need adult direction. They're not complete in themselves. They need that, okay? So that part's not surprising. But when I wanna repeat myself here. We agreed that when children misbehave, we often look at the parent and figure that parent's doing something or not doing something that has allowed that sort of behavior or that has uh, spawned that sort of behavior. So I ask you, what about God's children? <clears throat> when we see God's children misbehave, is it God's fault? <laughs> it's not, because he's perfect. He's a good parent. Wait, he's a good parent. He should have been teaching those kids better. He must be absent. He must not be attentive to their needs. He must not be dealing with them in a way that they can understand. Wait, this is God we're talking about. No, when God's children misbehave, it's on us. 100%. The thing is, the world may not see it that way. And that's important to us. Because the world might look at Christians and how Christians conduct themselves 
and make all sorts of value judgments on their family and on their parent. Peter is saying that is not how that's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that way. We do not conform ourselves to the former lusts as in ignorance. See, Peter's chosen his words carefully here. You were one way, formerly. Now, though, you need to be something different. Enough with the idea that Christians can do just about whatever the world can do, and it's okay. That's a lie. That's not in the scripture. In fact, the opposite of that is in the scripture. Peter would not have listened to that for one minute and thought that was anything but falsehood. That might be the gospel according to you, but it's a false gospel. When I was little and I was not doing as I should have been doing, my mother would tell me to straighten up. Straighten. Dad basically would say the same thing, except Dad had a lot more economy about him. He didn't actually use words. <laughs> because once upon a time, you, you've seen my dad, about that tall, but once upon a time, I was a lot shorter. And it seemed like I spent a good deal of my life being right about the level to him where his outstretched hand was about that level with me because he'd take his thumb and thump me right in the temple. <laughs> It's an attention getter. He just thumped me, bam. And then he would, other times, he would say things like, I'm going to thump you. Because that's what that is. That is what thumping is. And dad would thump me right there. <laughs> were, were my parents wrong for doing that? No, not even a little bit. I remember once saying to mom, and I think it might have been around church time, Probably right after. Probably. Like, I mean, like on a Sunday right after church. Uh, I wasn't that old. Probably 10, 12, somewhere in there. Maybe. Uh, that I, that I uh, thought that the only reason that, that she was really concerned with my behavior was that I was going to embarrass her, make her look bad. When I think back to some of those things, <laughs> I realize why my mother was like the most stubborn, strong little person ever. She had to be, because I was a... I was, I was too smart for my own good. I felt, I remember saying that to her, and I thought, I'm just having a reasonable conversation. She didn't disagree with that, though, interestingly enough. She didn't act like that bothered her that my behavior might embarrass her and that was reason enough for her to control my behavior. See, they weren't wrong to want, excuse me, they weren't wrong to not want to be embarrassed about the way their kid behaved. Not even a little bit. It was right for them to not want to be embarrassed about the way their kid behaved. See, here's the thing. God, he's a good parent. He's a perfect father. God is beyond embarrassment. You can't embarrass God. Okay, it's a different deal with him in that regard. But he still doesn't want you to misbehave. He does not want you to behave in a way that brings shame to him. He doesn't want you to behave in a way that brings shame to the name of Christ. And he doesn't want you to behave in a way that brings shame to the church. He doesn't. All of this behaving that he wants us to do, Peter says, basically, you need to straighten up. You need to behave yourself. All of that is enabled by the fact that God has given us salvation through Christ. We're not on our own, but we are responsible. To think otherwise, well, it's just not scriptural. So the idea that you're going to like, well, I, I got saved when it was like 1978. I remember I signed a card and I don't have much thought about it since then. Well, then guess what? 
I hope you can find that card. Maybe you can get something for your card because you got nothing else. If you being saved has not issued forth in real change and ongoing change, sorry. Amen. Don't add, I mean, you can tell me not to be judgmental and I'll just tell you, that ain't judgmental, that's a sermon. Right. You have to be changing. Right. Changed and changing. You can't keep acting the same way you used to. You can't. I used to do all sorts of things before I was a Christian. I never, thank God and thank my parents, I never got into smoking. I smoked a cigarette once, like not the whole thing. I mean, I took a drag on one once. Never was interested in drugs or marijuana. I tasted a beer once. I tasted whiskey once. That kind of stuff, I, 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 it wasn't a thing for me. However, I was a, I was a foul mouse kid when nobody was looking. That was my former thing. I love it when people say, oh, you, Christians can swear. Really? Show me that in the scripture. Amen. Show me where that is. You really think Jesus is going around saying GD this and you, no, hogwash. That's false. Man. That's a lie from the one that would damn your soul to hell. Right. You have to be different. Right. You have to be. Peter wants none of that stuff. Well, see, the only difference between, I, I, I act just like you, but really what's cool is I'm saved. So then I'm going to go to heaven because my sins are forgiven. And Jesus, What you're saying is God likes me more than he likes you because we're both acting the same way. I do everything you do, except now I'm on the other side of the fence. Baloney. No, that's not true. Uh, Peter says, uh, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. The word he uses there for ignorance is not really the way we would use it. We use it like it's just a lack of knowledge. I mean, some people think it means, some people think it's a criticism. I always love telling kids they're ignorant. Because they are, and I said, that just means you don't know. Right. You don't know. I'm not blaming you. You don't know. I'm going to tell you. Then you won't be ignorant anymore. Okay, that's not what Peter means. What, this word for ignorance here is not just this lack of knowledge. It's a moral defect. And really indicates a rebellion against God. And Peter says, you can't be part of that world if you're going to be part of God's world. You can't be rebelling against God and claim that you're with God. Right. It does not work that way. Verse 15, uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also, oh, and 16, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. So in my mind, this is the first landmark of this letter. Peter just lays it right out. God is holy, <coughs> therefore you should be holy. Then to further bolster the thought, he quotes Leviticus. That's one of those books that often gets skipped when people try to you know, read through the Bible. But apparently there's some stuff in there we ought to know about. Because what it says, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Well, that's in Leviticus. Peter didn't write that. He quoted that. Moses wrote that. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God is holy, therefore you should be holy. Now, <clears throat> um, we'll be dealing with this concept now throughout this whole study on 1 Peter. Verse 14 was framed in the negative. Like, don't misbehave. Don't do what you used to do. Verse 15 is framed in the positive. You need to act like God. The word holy is, uh, it really has two meanings. On the one hand, it means set apart for sacred use. On the other hand, it means morally pure, blameless in heart and life. Now we ought to be aware that basically all religions of the world 
have a concept of holy. And they all basically mean um, something other, something transcendent, something not of this world. So uh, in India, a holy man, you know, you might see him laying on a bed of nails or something. He is not of this world. He's separate. He's different. Yeah. So the word holy is used in all sorts of contexts. But um, in actuality, the word holy is descriptive of God. He is the only one that is holy because holy is what he is. Because like, what's God like? He's holy. Yeah, but what's he like? That is what he's like. He's holy. What he <laughs> is is what holy is. <laughs> He is other, okay? When we think of the set-apart kind of part of that definition, well, that doesn't really go far enough. Because like when I was at the school, I had a desk in my classroom. That desk was set apart. It was holy in that regard. It was set apart for my use. And no student ever sat there. Not without, not unless there was a prelude to a lot of volume. <laughs> I was one of those people. I wasn't one, of, I was, there was no problem in my mind over that as far as like, if you want, you kind of got, yeah, I did. There's some lines we don't cross. That desk was set apart for my use. I sat there. I also sat in their desks on occasion. But they never sat in mine. But we wouldn't say, really, we wouldn't say that desk was holy. It was set apart, but it wasn't holy. It, the, the holy part, it's not just set apart, it's set apart for sacred use. Again, you should understand, like an idol, a statue of Buddha, that's holy because it is set apart for sacred use. An African drum, that the witch doctor uses to call the ancestors might be described as holy for the same reason. It's set apart for sacred use. He don't use that drum when he's going down for a jam session on Saturday night. That's a special drum. Okay? But a Christian view of holy always points to God. It always points to God. He is holy, and holy is what he is. Peter's saying we should be holy in the sense of morally pure, blameless in heart and life. He says, get this, we should be holy in all our conduct. That's tall order, isn't it? That's tall order. We should be holy in all our conduct. Okay? So, what we say and what we do, what we think and what we do, we should be holy. That's tall order. The scribes and the Pharisees were busy attempting to do this very thing, but they were doing it of their own strength and with their own definitions. If we do enough of the right things, we'll be holy. The problem was they didn't start with the relationship with the living God. Peter gave us our starting point. Salvation. He says, you unwrap the gift. Now comes your part. But the good news is he will help us. You have to get up on your hind legs and do these things, but he will help you. We have to be different. We have to be different. If we're not different from the world, then I put to you that we're not different from the world. I mean, if we're not different, then we're not different. And you might want to rethink your claim that one of these days, the eastern sky is going to part, the trump will resound, 
and you're going to rise. Well, uh, just remember, it's not the most pleasant thought in the Bible. I mean, I, I guess we could believe it or not. It was only Jesus that said it. That someday at the end, it's all going to be done time. And some people are going to say, Lord, Lord, I'm with you. And he's going to say, mm, who are you again? I, I, no, you look all, you seem like all those other people. Depart from me. I never knew you. Don't kid yourself. That's real. That's real stuff. We have to be different from the world. Not because we just grew up our courage more, but because we have been, we have accepted this gift of salvation. We've been given this free gift of eternal life with God. Now we have to act on it. Now we have to do something with it. And to think that you can go on like you used to go, you can live in your former lust, to, for Russ Birch to say, oh, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right there where God wants me to be. And I talk just like I used to talk. And I gamble just like I used to gamble. And I look at things I used to look at. You'd have reason to call me a liar and a hypocrite. And a whole lot of things except a Christian. <laughs> Because Christians don't do those things. Oh, that's judgmental. Yeah, you know, the world's favorite verse in the Bible is judge not. Because they don't want anybody telling them what they're doing is wrong. Except they misquote that verse because they don't really know the Bible. So don't worry about that. We got to be different. I found this quote. I can't, I can't put this any better than this quote. The man's name is Homrighausen. Let's say he's German, perhaps Austrian. Listen to this. The church fails of impressiveness in the world, largely because there is not enough difference between the people inside and those outside to strike a contrast. The church fails of impressiveness in the world, largely because there's not enough difference between the people inside and those outside to strike a contrast. And just so we're clear here, you can't have a relationship with God and not be in the church. Like, well, there's the sinners, and then there's the church people that love God, and then there's these people that love God but don't need the church. Yeah. <clears throat> Wrong. Again, not in the scripture. Maybe in the gospel according to TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Maybe there, Twitter. Not in the Bible. If we are to have an impact on the world and to evangelize our little micro mission, we need to be different from the world. We don't like try to be like the world in an effort to win them. And we don't go around saying how much better we are than them because we're not like them, but we better not be like them. I mean, there ought to be at least one time in your life where your, your, your friends or your people you hang with start saying something or start talking about doing something and then look at you funny and say, mm, you probably wouldn't like this. There ought to be a time like that in your life. If there's not, I don't want to make you feel guilty, but you might want to pray about that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there ought to be. And not because you've been going around telling people how wrong they are. They're not on your team. So you don't have to tell them how wrong they are. But we're on a different team than that. Okay? You, you, you can't be a true, there's, a, there's only maybe one person going to feel this in their very bones. You can say whatever you want. You can't be a true blue, dyed in the wool, Boilermaker fan and root for Indiana. You ain't going to do it. You're not. You're going to be maybe polite, and but at some point you're going to be smiling when they get beat. You can't really be a hardcore Cubs fan and love it when the Cardinals win too. 
You might be a baseball fan and then it's okay because you're not really one or the other. But if you're a hardcore Cubs fan, I've seen those people. They can lose 120 games a year and just gain so much joy when the Cardinals lose twice. <laughs> yeah. It's, okay, so you can't, you, you think about that. You can't say I'm on God's team and also root for the other team. Right. You can't be on God's team Amen. and wear their uniform. You can't do it. Amen. It's a lie. And you're a liar if you try. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's important. It doesn't mean that we're never going to have problems. But it does mean that when we have those problems, we deal with them in a different way than the world does. Well, I'd love to tell you about how once I became a Christian, I never did anything wrong again. I'd love to tell you that story. That'd be a story in the sense that my mother used to tell me not to tell stories. <laughs> yeah. She meant lying. Yeah. That's not been the case. But I can tell you that when those things have happened, I dealt with it different. I came back to God. Yeah. I got a hold of myself. I was self-controlled. Interestingly enough, I've never found a way for God to make me self-controlled. It wouldn't be being self-controlled then. It'd be being God-controlled, right? Yeah. So, anyway, you get the point. I left a uh, quote on there. Some guy, I think he was Jesus' brother. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like you could take it for what it's worth. He was a mild-mannered fellow. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Right. Okay. You don't hear that one very much, do you? Mm -hmm. Don't see that one in a colorful thingy on Facebook too often, because that sounds harsh. Uh, I think Jesus sometimes is thinking, like, let's just pick a side. Remember in, remember in uh, Revelation, I think about chapter 3, he's talking about the church at Laodicea. Yeah, pick a side. You make me want to throw up. All right, anyway, you get the idea. More on this later. Father, thank you for your word to us tonight. Help us to know, Lord, that you mean exactly what you say in your word. There, it's not a suggestion. You want us to be sober, level-headed, self-controlled, not acting like we used to. You want us to be different because of the salvation that you have purchased for us. We should be different from the world. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to know that our little church here, we may never be able to have some slam-bang program that will attract people in by drugs, but we can act in a way that is pleasing to you, and we can be an influence on one or two people at a time. Help us to do that, Lord. By your grace, help us to do it. We ask in Jesus' name. Well, have a great week, and I'll see you on Sunday.